And she would go, no, you can do it. I believe in you. I was like, wow. If she believes in me, I guess I could do it. Uh, okay, I'll keep going. You know, so I just pick it up and go back out there and hit it again. And then uh, if what happens What is what I would call the tipping point. So at some point, it's not so hard to sell stuff anymore. And you have a brand and people, they love it. Hey there, and welcome to the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Emmy Kirshner. I'm a serial entrepreneur, investor, and business coach for ambitious women who are boldly taking their business to the next level. And I believe that building a successful business isn't about working 24 seven just to merely meet a revenue goal. What it does take is a unique blend of dedication to purpose, courageous action, and frequently sheer will to overcome the odds that lead to meaningful impact and experiencing a life well lived. In each episode, you'll get to know the women and men who are unafraid to put it all on the line as they share the stories of success and failure that have made them incredible leaders and the magic they gift the world with. As you're listening, and I hope finding value, don't forget to share the Tribe of Leaders podcast with all of your other entrepreneurial friends and to follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast. Hey, Tribe. If there's anything that I've learned in my 10 plus years on this roller coaster ride of an entrepreneurial journey, it's that you have to be able to move through a lot of mistakes, failures, and learning experiences in order to get to the other side of success. And my guest today, Bew White the Third, is really no different. He's the chairman of the board of Gabriella White and its brands, Summer Classics, and Gabby and Wendy Jane. They offer outdoor furnishings along with home accessories, et cetera. And this was a, just an incredible interview. Bu shares how he essentially for his entire entrepreneurial journey has one been a risk taker, but has just outlasted the failure and the learning experiences to reach a tipping point where the success starts to come. And that's where a lot of entrepreneurs end up giving up right before they hit that tipping point. So I hope you find what he has to say really encouraging. The other thing that really made this interview so special for me is that Bu shares his near-death experience and what that was like, how he was feeling and what he was thinking and how it has dramatically changed his life and what he focuses on. It was really an emotional moment and I'm so glad and grateful that he was willing to share that with me and with you. So I really hope that you enjoy this episode and everything that you can get out of it. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am your host, Emmy Kirshner. I have Bu White on the show today. He is the chairman of the board of Gabriella White and its brands, Summer Classic and Gabby and Wendy Jane. Bu has, I'm going to say, the most diversified life experience I have at least read on paper in a very long time. And one, I want to welcome you to the show, but two, I can hardly wait to hear about everything that you have moved through in your life because you've had a lot of ups and downs. Yeah, I think Elon Musk might have outdone me. <laughs> I, I watched that SpaceX show. I was like, wow, what's, I thought I was a risk taker. This guy's like unbelievable what he does. And he yeah. has eight children. I don't know if you knew that. I'm like, wow. No, no. He's I not there. So sorry, I don't have that problem. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this guy is yeah. a risk taker. Yeah, I think he thrives in it. But um... yeah. yeah, he does. He thrives in it. Let's I'm, uh, I think I was like that at, when I was as a problem that you, you were. Oh, I was, I'm, and, you know, the, there's a book, this EOS, you, you know, about EOS, yes, yes. you know, wrote a book about the six traits of an entrepreneur. And one of them is risk taker and all like, and they did a study on uh, people over 85 and about their regrets in life. And, and one of the big one, the, maybe the number one thing was I didn't take enough risk. And I was like, yeah. well, I don't have that problem. I think I took too many rips, you know. <laughs> so I was like, I was just, I put my house up every year for 10 years and I'm, take all the equity out. But my wife, don't tell my wife. <laughs> Everybody, don't say anything. Is that the biggest risk you've taken or what's, like, what would you say? Is no, the- no, I, I, was, I was constantly borrowing money 
So, cause I had to finance, I was doubling every three and a half years. So I had to borrow money and I have what's called open door policy on banks. So if a bank wants to take me a lunch or breakfast or whatever, I'll come in for a meeting. I'm in, you know, I'm a, right. I want to talk to you cause I was, I was always outgrowing my line with the bank. I was with small bank. I mean, if you read the Nike story, that's, it's very similar to what happened to him. Okay. Or with a small bank, I'd get to a million dollars. So, well, we're capped out with you. You're going to have to find another bank. Oh, wow. I didn't know there's such a thing. Okay. Let me go find another bank. Okay. What's your limit? Three million. Okay. We'll go there. And then five and then 15. And then I guess like, wow. I'm the good. And then Royal Bank of Scotland came in my office and it was like, oh, we could do a hundred or more if you need it. It's like, oh man, I'm done here. This is great. And then I would be letting me, I kind of wrote my own ticket, no personal guarantees. I'm like, this is not, and my father at the time was co-signing 800,000 on my loan. So I was like, you're done, you're off. And I was like, he was like, yeah. He was like, so then, uh, then the 2008 hit and I was in, I was like, I'm, the bite started, they didn't like my space. I'd never heard of this space. What space? space to me was outer space. It wasn't, they didn't, right. I said, you mean you don't like my space? The business you're in, the people, you know, the customers you have, the, that you're seasonal, that you're high end, you know, like, mm. so what do you like? Groceries, you know, things people have to have. I was like, wow, I was like, well, they don't have to have my products. So I got, they started squeezing me and I was like, I cannot figure out how to get out of this. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, so I tried, I couldn't sleep at night. I would literally get out of bed and just go get, get on the sofa because I don't want to wake my wife up. Mm -hmm. But I can't figure this out on my own. I was constantly praying about what to do. And I came, came up with this idea of that. Was, well, I'm going to call my vendors because I owe them millions of dollars. If something happens to me, I'm not going to be able to pay them. So I went from the biggest vendor down and started calling. The big biggest vendor said, I have an idea. Just don't pay me. I was like, wow. Like ever, it's just like, no, just don't pay me right now. Just ride your payables. Like how much? And he said, $2 million. So then I called the next one and he said a million, he'd do a million dollars. I was like, wow, this, this may work. And then I just kept calling suppliers until I came up with like $10 million. And I ended up paying my line down from out of 19.8 million. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in February of 2009, and the Oriel Scotland Scotland had lost $62 billion in the fourth quarter of 2008, the largest loss in corporate history. And so they were squeezing their clients because that's the only place they could get money. I didn't realize they were going to run out of money. Fortunately, Bank of England didn't take them over. I really would have been in trouble. And then, uh, so I paid it down to like two and a half million dollars by November by selling my inventory and then not buying a lot and then getting my vendors to let me ride them. And that was the scariest. Yeah. And what I mean, was it? about sell how much your house is worth, <laughs> how much you can get out of it and whether you're going to have to sell your house or not, you know, just all the things right, that could right. go through your mind that, during a time where you're in stress. Yeah. What was going on with the business where you needed to keep taking on bigger and bigger loans and then trying to kind of offset with payables? We're seasonal, right? So we're right. a big business. So we're close to 200 million now. 150 of that is outdoor furniture. So what you do in that scenario is you're, you're betting. I call it the moat. The moat is this big bet that we make coming up here. We're going to, we're starting the bet right now. We'll make the big bet here between the end of September on what we think we will sell for next year. And then we, we bring that product in or we manufacture part of it, but we're really a made to order house. So it needs to kind of be sitting here in March when the season starts. Right now, we have like $60 million in inventory. So you have to make this big bet, put it in an inventory, and hope your clients will buy it and hope your forecast will try too on how much you would sell. And you have a little wiggle room, but pretty much by October, you better know exactly what's going to happen in March, April, May, and June. Or you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be out of stuff if you're overselling, or you're going to be, you know, have too much, which is what we're having right now is too much, which you're, which you're hearing that in the marketplace a lot because you're watching about Target and all the other people saying, oh my God, I'm way over an inventory. And we have about double the inventory we had last year, but you know, I'm, I'm not nervous about it because we're still selling, we're still selling real, really, we're, we're, our order activity is still relatively strong, but we're going to run, 
our backlog, I don't know if this was too much information. Our backlog is like 40 something, $45 million. And so we're eating into that backlog. First five months, we ate like $8 million of our backlog. And then we're eating about $4 million a month of backlog. And so if we keep doing that in 10 months, we're going to be out of backlog and we're just going to be selling and shipping what we sell. Right. So that's why I think the market's feeling that. And that's why you see the stock market going down because yeah, it's going to be good for the next couple of quarters, but then everybody's going to run out of these big backlogs and they're going to have to sell what they, you know. Yeah. So it's really playing what the game. Kind of what was that? Kill what you eat is what you yeah. say in the honey business. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's really <laughs> also in your business, kind of this strategic guessing game and then, and putting money in a certain volume and then figuring out how to make sure that you kind of create some balance and flow every year. Unfortunately, I'm, we've been in business a long time, so we have some history that yeah. we can go. But we're in fashion business, so we're coming out with 500 new products a year, and we got those we have to really guess on because we yeah. don't know what we're going to sell. But you can you can go to market and figure out pretty well. But we're buying, and we're, we're bringing it in the full market. The model is very similar to Nike and Ralph Lauren's business model, where we design everything. We have captive factories that make our product so we can keep our quality spec to a certain degree and then bring it in and hopefully sell it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it ties up a lot of cash. I mean, that, 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 big, that big bet is what's tied up cash is what happened during the recession. We have shrinking sales, which is what everybody's estimates is going to happen. You have shrinking sales. And then you have too much inventory and you can't convert it to cash. Right, right. So how much sleep did you lose over that amount, like that period where you were? <laughs> I used to say I didn't need amphetamines to stay awake because I couldn't sleep at all. I get, I'm guessing I would sleep four or five hours a night. I but even there, you know, even that sleep is fitful. I right. would go to sleep pretty quick because you're exhausted, right? But then you'd wake up and you start thinking and your brain dominated your your ability to sleep and so you're like okay i'm not i'm not gonna go to sleep i need to just get up and go downstairs and see if i can figure this out because i'm gonna be thinking about it all the time yeah Yeah. and but at the same point like you didn't quit or shift gears like you stayed the course within i presume some constructs too i said my i wanted you know there's a that's a really a critical part of what's happened to me in the the in the what I call my MBA of mistakes is I had my wife was so supportive that I would make a huge mistake like this borrowing this twenty million dollars, and I would go like I can't keep doing this. I can go get a job for I'm not even paying myself hardly. This is crazy. And she would go, No, you can do it. I believe in you. I was like, Wow. If she believed in me, I guess I could. Do it. Okay, I will keep going. You know, so I just pick it up and go back out there and. Hit it again. And then uh, what happens What is what I would call the tipping point. So at some point, it's not so hard to sell stuff anymore. And you have a brand and people are driven, you know, they love it. And it's so different that you're not struggling with your dealer base to get orders every year. They're coming in wondering where they can buy from you. They want to buy more. You know, they want to sell more and they know they can sell it now. Is so different than trying to edge into the marketplace and get your spot on the floor right, where right. people will buy again from you. And and if you make one mistake, they're you know, calling you and cussing you out. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, this is a huge customer. I can't lose that one. You know, mm-hmm. it's so it is so different. You know, when you get across that threshold, so it's it- hard to for most people because they're usually struggling to make those sales over and over, year after year. You know. And losing clients, and you go know, like, I don't know how I'm going to replace this client. Yeah. Do you feel like it, the key to success is just the perseverance of getting to the tipping point? It's the drive. It being, I think that may be why I could sleep too. I'm so driven, so driven to, to and, and you'd say it's driven to succeed, but I don't, I don't feel like I'm really mon- I'm money hungry, you know. And, and of course, society, you know, wants you to succeed or doesn't want you to succeed. You know, either way, I think if you look at the news, you should say they don't want you to succeed. They're looking for the negatives. Right. You know, you have this drive to succeed, to be successful or whatever the reason is. I think, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure that's in most of us. And so you've got, you 
if you're if you have those traits I was talking about, then you can get you can get there. Yeah. And you have to you can't give up. You have to never give up. It's the it's the Churchill speech, you know, never, never, never give up. Yeah. And the and the grit, the grit to push through in a situation where you think you can't push through. And but I think most people do give up. They mostly they give up. They probably had a good idea and they just give up. And something happens. They're like, I can't do this. I just need to get a job. Right, right. And I mean, if if I look back at all of my entrepreneurial mistakes and challenges, the times where I've been the most freaked out and the most this is impossible are the times that the most magic has happened. And I don't know about you, but I get into a space somewhere around four o'clock in the morning where. Yeah, like, people, yeah, these people asked you, why did you send me a text at 4.30? <laughs> I haven't had well, that. Out of your, but, don't turn your phone off. <laughs> yeah, but like it's where, I don't know, something happens for me. And I'm like, I'm I'm just going to make this happen. Like this is going to happen and I don't care what I have to do anymore. Eventually you figure it out. I think maybe yeah. it's not through your own power, but some another power is you go like, okay, I got this. I can do this. And you you get wisdom. I mean, you get wisdom from mistakes, but certainly more so than you do from successes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes a little more smacked in my face than, than yeah, I then like. Yeah, then you have like, like, yeah, I got it. I got it. So leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Share, like, what, how, let's talk about your entrepreneurial journey and what that looked like for you at the beginning of your career. Yeah, you, know, you you made me feel like that little profile thing that was it's like, wow, I started like 11 or 12 companies. I only have three now. But so that that shows you how many failures I have. And then I've got the real estate portion of what we did. We actually have another company in theory, which is our real estate company, by buying, comp- by buying buildings and leasing it to ourselves. That's been, that's an, inc- I kind of thought about it a little bit in the beginning, but then I got started doing it a lot and it became a huge part of our net worth you know so it's it's something i didn't see coming but it's it's been incredible so i got out of college and went to new york city and started selling fabric in the that's back when cutters were all the dresses and uh clothing was made in the united states so we were selling to really the big cutters were our big business Lee Van strauss and wrangler and hd lee and people like that those were our really big customers and we were making the fabric in the United States. And I was, it was my great grandfather's company, and he was a governor and senator of Alabama. And he started all this, you know, this big company to become a Fortune 500 company. And I was the first one in the third generation to get in. I was like, okay, well, this is going to be awesome. I, and then I thought to my cousins came in after me. And I was like, well, this may not be so awesome. I'm not going to have to be fighting with my cousins. You know, while right. I'm just, I was also calling on entrepreneurs. I, I went out to lunch with one of my clients one day and I said, Hey, you mind he had like four or five employees. You mind telling me what you make, what you pay yourself? And he told me, I was like, Well, that's more than the president of a company makes. Because we were public, you could see what the, the executives were getting paid. I was like, Maybe that maybe this is what I need to do. This is you know, I think I could do this. I think I could. so I got with my father, who's on the board of the company house market. He said, Yeah, this is a pretty good idea. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go find something, you know, see if I can start over. Well, the, that was the beginning of my, my, my mistakes. <laughs> I bought a disaster. I got bought into, I took 25% of my net worth and I invested in a company. that, But they got me in the furniture business. They were in the furniture business. I was interested in that because it was more design-oriented. I felt like that's, I had followed Ralph Lauren all over New York trying to figure out how to sell and stuff. And. I was fascinated with his business model. <clears throat> and uh, nine months later, I, I, I just walked away from my investment and said, this is not going to work. And I started a sales rep company because I was really good at selling. Selling was my forte. So I go out and start selling. And I'm making, now I'm making, I was I went from making 60000 where I was to making twenty five at this company I bought part of. <clears throat> now, now I get to selling product and making commissions. This is interesting. They haven't. I didn't realize that people didn't pay their commissions. So I got out there and started selling and my commissions came due. And I would call them and go like, Hey, I, you owe me like $10,000. And they go like, well, we're having cash flow problems. 
cash flow? What do you mean cash flow? What do you mean? What is cash flow? I didn't even know what cash flow was. And they're like, you know, we're having, we can't pay our bills. I was like, well, I'm a, not a, I'm not a payable. I'm not, let's like help. Right. So I was like, okay, this is, this is different. I just collect my commission. So, so, but I got to, I figured all that out. And yeah, I just quit selling for those guys and then I would collect my money and I just, I would just drop the line. But I was like, that, that was really stupid of y'all not to pay me because I'm the guy that's out here pushing the product for you and you can't do that with sales. Y'all need right. to, you know, open it. And then I said, if I ever do this, I'm never going to not pay the sales, pay the sales people before I pay myself, you know, that. And so, uh, I, that's, that's really kind of one of the things that's really helped us get, you know, people, salespeople, we have some salespeople that have been with 25 years. So, and they're great. So really keeping, keeping good people. Mm-hmm. Pay your, <laughs> anyway, so then I get, build that up and I'm making two hundred thousand dollars a year, but I'm never at home. I'm always gone. I was like, I've got to start something that's not so dependent on me. And maybe I can start something like Avondale Mills, which was a great grandfather's company, and have employees and that love working here. That was my dream. Right, so right. I, I've started, I, since I was in furniture, I started all these other companies. I started like 10 different companies making all kinds of <laughs> wicker and glass and mirrors and and finally i started this summer classics thing i actually stole the name from one of my customers i found i couldn't do that so i called and i said can i buy the name from you or something it's like it's like no but I, i'm not doing it anymore you can just have it. i said will you sign something okay i signed it to her okay great so so because he had started this for his own storage for South Carolina Summer Classics. And I ran into it. I was like, I love that idea. And I tried to get a patent. And he said, you can't get a patent. He's already got the, he can't, he's got the trademark. How? He said, well, he, he, he has first rights because he started, okay, all right, let me call him. So that, that worked out great for me. Anyway, so I started making product I like for myself and, Turns out I was a baby boomer and everybody else that was a baby boomer kind of liked it too. So I started selling stuff and then it became a demand issue. I couldn't keep up mm-hmm. and I was doubling every three and a half years. And then it became a cash. You know, I just had to borrow money constantly because I was seasonal and I had to have enough inventory to ship in season. So I'm borrowing tons of money and I'm it kind of walked you through that going from bank to bank thing. So those were my challenges. But I think one of the great rewards for me is that I was able to get my I get, I get to, you know, like I start thinking about retirement. I was like, I don't have any kids in here. I, my, I get my kids in the run. And they're like, we're not working for you. Because <laughs> you get know, like, yeah, okay, I can see I could be difficult, particularly since I'm your father. And so, uh, you know, they remember the spy games. I remember the good stuff. Right. <laughs> and so uh, I finally I convinced my, I got my son in back. He said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. If you'll do EOS, I was like, what's EOS? Okay. What is it? What's EOS? He explained to me, okay, we'll do that. And he was amazed that I would do it. I was like, no, because I was real, it was a real top down, you know, when, right, when right. I, I was running it myself. Yeah. I love EOS. Oh, I'll do that. Do it. You do whatever you want to do. It's going to be, you know, your thing. So we'll do, we'll, we'll do EOS. It was transformative for us. EOS was so. But I think I've talked too much. <laughs> I don't know, not at all. I am curious. I read it was a summary of one of your other podcast interviews that you almost died of blood clots, and I'm really curious what that experience was like, but how it it changed things for you too. It's like dying. That's what it feels like. I mean, I so my, yeah, I think this scares people. They, people don't like to talk about death, and I think I think God keeps death out of your brain. Because if it if it jumped in there all the time, it would bother you so much you couldn't live with yourself, you know. So please, right. so so you don't think about it. But I, I had that I had five blood clots in my lungs, and I fortunately was at the hospital right before that because I was having a terrible problem in my legs, and it turns out I had blood clots in my right leg, tons of them, and five had gone into my lungs, and I couldn't breathe hardly, and so. Um, I stay in the hospital overnight. My wife comes over and I'm, and I have one hit something and my heart starts to stop. And you get a signal to your brain that says you're going to die. And I got that. So it's, first I thought I had heartburn, but I was like, 
this is something terrible. No, I'm going to die. And so I'm pushing the button to get the nurse to come and I, they're not answering. So I text my wife, help. And she's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I was like, I think this is it. I think she knew what I meant by that. So she's running up to the room and I'm finally the nurses come on. What's wrong this morning? I said, this is going to sound crazy, but I'm going to die. And I have a guy. I have minutes left. It's not. And so they rushed into the room, filled me full of dopamine and saw water, pushed me down in the bed. And I'm like, they was like, take him to ICU, take him to ICU. And I was like, kind of calculating how I felt and what, how far it was to get to the elevator. I was like, we're not going to make it to the elevator, guys. I'm dead. Sorry. Yeah. And, my, and I was turning white because the blood won't pump to your brain anymore. I was watching myself die. And I was like, Okay, that's what life was like. And you, you, you don't have time to think, to reflect. You just, the thing that came to me was infinity, that this is life and the rest is forever. Death, you know what I'm saying? Right. What they say, so you're a long time dead. Well, yeah, you're ever, forever, for infinite. And how, how big that looked to me, how big infinity looked. And so, I got to have talk into this part. So then I came back mm-hmm. and we just think that was 2013. It would be easier to get through this block. And I just started crying uncontrollably. I just saw it. I couldn't help myself. I just saw it. Wow. Is this real? Am I going to die? Am I, why am I here? It doesn't make any sense. I shouldn't be here. It's somebody trying to tell me something. What I do. It's just tough. It, so I mean, it you reflect and say, okay. How do I fix whatever I did wrong? You know, your personality doesn't change. You know, people said they thought I would completely change. I was like, not really. I mean, you're not going to, if you're at a certain age, you're, you can't just flip a switch and become a different person. Right. But you can work on it gradually. I learned that when I did my 25th anniversary for my wife. And I, and I watched my kids talk about her. And I said, okay. I've got to be a better husband. And I committed myself to work on that. And it was, I think I did it. Or, I don't think I've ever got to, to, broken up in an interview before. Sorry. No, that's, I mean, this is this life, right? Like, yeah. I think one of the things I appreciate is being able to share stories and have the emotion because I can't even imagine. So I started trying to write these facts. I got a signal at the same time saying, okay, write the book. I was like, mm, okay, you know, I can't write, right? So I was like, I started working on it. I couldn't, I didn't, didn't, I wrote a couple of the chapters, but I had 13 and 11 were throwaways, you know? So I was like, I got to find somebody to help me write this. So I started interviewing people to help me write it. And so it took me till 2000. 18 or 19 to get somebody to So it took me five years or six years to to get somebody to help me write it. Yeah. When you were having this whole experience, though, was were you afraid? Or like you're telling it with emotion, but fairly calmly in, in your thought I process. That, yes. You're well, you de- I definitely think about heaven or hell, you know, that kind of thing. But you don't have time to, you know, I don't think you have time to be afraid. Did you make a decision to stay? To stay alive? <laughs> Yeah. No, because I couldn't, I didn't think I was in control. I had no control. This is okay. like, you're totally out of control. You don't have control of the situation. I'm in control. You are going to die or not. And it's just, it's, I guess it's frightening, but I don't know. Fear is not necessarily that infinity thing was what got me. I was just like, okay, wow, you better, you better get your life in order. It's sort of, sort of the message I got. So, I started working on a lot of different things, small, mostly estate related. You know, I was like, I didn't want to leave my wife with a mess. I was saying, I don't know if you read this part of the book, but I was constantly saying to my wife, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right there, when I went on stuff. And so I was trying to figure out why I was saying that. Now I get how I would get to the end of life and not say that. But I think it's mostly about leaving her with having to deal with, you know, all the stuff I'd done in my life and whether that was valuable or not or, or make it where she wouldn't have to deal with. And that t- at that time, my son wasn't 
<laughs> he was in the company, but he was not willing to run. Right. Ended up hiring a, a guy that had an MBA from Harvard that I'd met at, uh, I belonged to the International Business Fellows. And he was one of the speakers on the impact. Begged him to come to Birmingham and help me figure this thing out. And that was right before I almost died. And then I called him and said, I need you to come run the company in case something happens to me. So he agreed. He came down and helped me. I said, I said, really, the real thing I need you to do is help me get my son where he's willing to run it. And he did. Mm-hmm. And then that's when William came to me and said, I want to do EOS. And sure, try it. You know, just run run the company because, you know, I don't think we want somebody from outside the family to run it. Now, I think you can do it. And he's done a great job. You know, so, yeah. so it was hard. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate your responsibility. Yeah. People ask me to speak yeah. about that. I, I have not been able, I was like, I'm not sure I could do it because I don't know if I get through it emotionally. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Have you seen Captain Phillips, the movie? Because there's an end, at the end of the movie where he's on the boat, he, the, the Navy SEAL shoots all the people on the boat with him, except for him. And he gets back on the boat and he is, it's Tom Hanks, right? So he's, he's crying uncontrollably. He's with the nurse on the boat. And I was like, I go to my wife, I'm like, that's it. That's exactly how I felt. I said, I was, that's my behavior at the time. That's it. And so if anybody's seen that, Except it was, it lasted, I don't know how long it lasted for Captain Phillips, but for me, it was hours. I was like, because you could just go, why am I alive? This is, am I going to die right now? And then for months after that, you'll have the, you'll have heartburn and it may just be heartburn, but you're like, okay, is this it? And then I started exercising a lot and that kind of, I think that helped my heart a lot. Mm-hmm. They don't, they don't re-X-ray you. For your blood clots are in your lungs that are like, there's nothing we can do. They're either going to go through and kill you or, or they're going to pray. Or it's like, we can't fix it. We can't go in there and cut them off. And they're like, okay. But I'd kind of like to know if they're still there. Yeah. Yeah. I would nope. think that they would want to re-X-ray you. And- yeah. Nope. Or CT <laughs> X-ray. Or they're dead. They were. Wow. Wow. So you you decided to work with. You're either I love that or hate that. Oh, that's. <laughs> That part of the interview, I don't know, depends on their emotional tact. Well, I, this is what I appreciate about it is you're sharing something that not many people experience. And when you're you're sharing what your thought process was, but also what you've taken away from it and what was really important to you and, and that you felt like in the apology to your wife that you needed to do things, something, do something differently. It's big. Like that gives people, a lot of people opportunity to really look at their own lives and their relationships. And what's, and I say this to my people all the time, like what's really important in what you're doing and how you're spending your time. Yeah, that's the throughput of the book for relationships. So think about me going to the suppliers and them giving me $10 million. If I didn't have those relationships, would I have been able to pull that off? No. And so, or my wife saying, you can do this, you can do this. Yeah, like her, her. Or my father saying, you know, you don't have to work for this company. Your great grandfather story. Okay, wow. Yeah, that's this, huge. There's relationship after relationship. Those touch points are so much more important than you realize at the time. Yeah, well, I mean, he gave you permission to do your own thing instead of feeling obligated. Yeah, and I know for my kids, that was one of the things that was really important for me was go do the thing that lights you up. Like you don't have to follow this path of go to school, go to four years of college, you know, get the job, work nine to five. And both of my kids have chosen alternative paths and they're very successful and they're happy. Mm-hmm. I've got the rope on mine. <laughs> <laughs> I've roped them in and they are stuck. Oh. <laughs> it's like My older guy, I keep roping them back in. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if for somebody who's and we're going to put the link to the book in the show notes, of course. But for somebody who's like, oh, I want to check this book out, what do you want them to get out of it in addition to the relationships? I think, you know, they look at a, like a Mark Zuckerberg or all those guys that have been so successful so quickly, even Bill Gates. It's not like that. It's just not, not. It's just having your own small business mindless. I, mean, I can remember when we hit a million dollars and we were just right. like having a party, you know. 
it's so different than the, than what these uh, and these guys that went public and made a lot of money. It's so different having your own business, and it's I think it's the pushing through the difficult times that we kind of talked about that a little bit. But that's what I hope that the entrepreneurs that read it, and then the wives or the spouses that read it. In your case, it may be the husband reading the supportive. The support of that person is critical or support of not just that person, but other people around you. So my employees were like, you know, they were all, right, they were, right. I would say that guy take a bullet for him. and had a lot of bullet takers here. So that really made a big difference. It just, they wanted to build the company with you. They saw the future that you were able to communicate. Right. And they, you know, the, the visionary part, they believed in the vision. I always said, this is a $500 million company. We just haven't done it yet. And, you know, at some point they're like, hey, we're $10 million. Why do you say stuff like that? I said, cause we're going to do it. Watch. And now they're kind of going, well, I don't think we're going to do it. And so it's a really, it's, you got to have those people with you, <laughs> behind you, you know, in front yeah, of you. It really- you do have to throw those people if you're, if you read the Nike book, you'll see that it, Phil Knight scored, you know, guys, I don't, I'm pretty sure none of them were with him after when he was writing the book, but he was writing all about them. Yeah. Because they were, they helped him build it. Well, it takes a village. Yeah. And I think does. most entrepreneur, entrepreneurs feel alone a lot and finding that support team is really crucial. Well, in, in your tendency is to hire people that are like you, but you need to be the opposite. Mm-hmm. You don't understand them because they're different than you. But occasionally they'll come out with something that's genius and you're like, wow, I never thought about that. You know, I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, so. And so I had a guy work for me for 25 years that was like that. And it's almost it's 27 years with me from White Eye College. And he was, he was a thinker. He didn't say much. But boy, when he did, you're like. It was something you weren't thinking about, and he was so right on. It was, I, I called it yin and yang. If I was a yin, he was yang. So he thought differently than, than me, but in the same, yeah, you know, he, he he wanted to make it work, but he had different perspective. And it's great to have that different perspective. Yeah, I think that's really, really important. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, it all creates kind of a balance and fluidity. Yeah. That is, I think, really important in any. He was obviously an accountant. I was yeah. like, he's an accountant, and he could, he understood operations and accounting and how all that works together. And I teach and you know, all that stuff. Yeah. That I had no interest in learning. I had to learn to read a financial statement because I was like, if I figure this thing out, I'm going to go out of business. So I've got to figure. I got to learn how to read this financial statement. Yeah, I have many clients who have. Um, been learning that. <laughs> so. I'd say uh, if any advice I could give to somebody coming out of college that want to have their own business, that would be numero uno, learn to read a financial statement. Yeah, it's so like it, it's so <laughs> empowering because you can make really smart decisions based on the financial statements. Mm-hmm. So even small, even when you're a $500,000 company. Yeah. It, when you're bigger, you can hide stuff. But when you're Small, you can't. I mean, the electric bill, everything. Cl- who cleans the bathroom? You know, all that stuff became critical for us right, at right. many times. Yeah. You, this has been amazing. Yeah. We're at a time. I feel like <laughs> I could talk to you for like three hours. Like, there's so much yeah. more to pull out and to discuss. But there's a lot of junk in there. <laughs> stuff. I think there's a lot of value in there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, oh. But I, I want to encourage the audience to pick up your book. A summer classic, and I presume they can get it on Amazon. But where else can they yep. find it? Amazon? And you know, I was talking to you earlier about my roommate in college, was an actor, producer, director. He he called me. He said, "I want to read your book." I said, "Well, you, this, they told me you read it already." No, no, I want to read it for Audible. I want to do the Audible for your book. I was like, "Okay, great." Oh, awesome! So he reads it, and he's, he's talking about crying. He's crying during certain sections. I call and said, "Michael, you you were crying." Are you acting or are you, was that real? Was, well, what sections was it in? I was like, okay, <laughs> you're acting, darn. <laughs> Could have sworn you are getting emotional. Anyway, so he's, if you like Audible, he's, it, it's, it's, it's really good. Yeah, I love Audible. Oh, yeah, I'm a big Audible guy too. So, yeah. Where um, can everybody? Yeah, on Amazon, 
Oh, go ahead. Or Google View White. My name, if you Google my name, you'll get every podcast. Or it's kind of scary, actually, if you're me, because my name is unusual. So you're only going to get me. And then, um, you know, it's only in hard back. But okay, awesome. I bet you I use one for two dollars. <laughs> I don't know. I th- I gave them to all my employees. I said, now don't go something on the internet. No, these are collector <laughs> items. Exactly. I signed yours. Doesn't sign. You could get ten thousand dollars for that book. <laughs> no, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on. And and thank again, you. I want to appreciate and, and acknowledge your vulnerability and sharing your story. You have my emotional. You got me. Congratulations. <laughs> you get the nerves. <laughs> well, I usually don't talk about all that. I kind of skim through it. I do talk about dying, but I don't get that much all the time. That's worth sharing. So I'm really grateful. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being a listener of the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am so grateful for each and every episode that you tune in and listen to. And I hope that you get a ton of value that you can implement starting today. I do have just a quick favor. If you wouldn't mind hopping on to wherever it is that you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating and review, it would help us tremendously so that the Tribe of Leaders podcast can be found more easily and help inspire other entrepreneurial leaders. 